Alright guys, the Unit 9 presentation on drivetrain design. So first things first, we have to discuss a couple of major things. First is friction. That is the force that's going to oppose motion. Only present when two surfaces are moving against each other. There's two different types. One is static and one is kinetic. Static means not moving. Kinetic means moving. So when an object is moving, it has uh, kinetic friction. When an object is not moving, it has static friction. And when it comes down to it, friction always acts up opposite of the motion. So if your motion is to the right, then friction is to the left. If your motion is to the left, then your friction is to the right. When an applied force goes up, a static force is going to go up. Static friction force is going to increase until the object begins to move and then kinetic friction takes over. When it comes down to it, these two different types of frictional forces, static will always be larger than kinetic for a lot of reasons, one of which is once an object is moving, it has momentum and that decreases the friction um, amongst other things. For now, we also want to talk about how are frictional forces actually going to be affected? What affects them? One is normal, which involves gravity and weight, and the other is going to be grip. So in other words, how much friction is actually present based on the grip or the, the interaction of two surfaces right next to each other, okay? In order to figure out what this is, the force of friction can be calculated by taking the coefficient of friction and multiplying it by the weight force, also known as normal. Now, normal is a force that is going to act opposite of a surface, or I'm sorry, perpendicular of a surface that the object is located on. That's going to be the normal force, which is, of course, going to act um, by uh, opposing the weight of an object. So in other words, if you think of an object laying on a table, the normal force is going to be pointing opposite of gravity. In fact, normal points opposite of gravity to counteract gravity specifically. Um, we use the terms gravity and weight interchangeably in this class, um, but you should know that weight is going to be um, the effect of a mass by gravity. So it's not necessarily the exact same thing, okay? Normal forces are typically just equal exactly to the weight that um, those objects feel. Um, when it comes to a normal force, again, it acts perpendicular to the surface that it's actually on. Next thing we're going to talk about is traction. So this is going to be the specifically friction between a drive wheel, so a wheel on a surface that it is actually moving on. So traction is going to be wheel specific and for us we're going to use the traction of our wheels on the type of surface that we have been driving on since the beginning. Some of you probably think that surface is not very grippy. Some of you may not realize that that surface is going to be more grippy than most that we can drive on. Um, and so when when you drive your robot around on the carpet, it's a very different interaction than when you drive your robot around on our actual field. Different traction, different surfaces. Think difference between ice and concrete, if you will. Um, when it comes to the types of forces that we need to uh, understand, normal and traction are two that we've talked about. We've also involved torque in our arguments before. Um, and that is going to come into play as well here in a little bit. But for now, I just want to make sure you understand the normal force is going to be one that acts opposite of the surface that the wheel is in contact with. Or I'm sorry, perpendicular to the surface that the wheel is in contact with. Traction is going to act between the wheel and the surface itself. Okay, so when we apply torque with a wheel, it's going to apply that force of torque to the ground. Okay, this is not going to happen unless there is friction between the wheel and the ground. So all contact has friction in our world and in the planet that we live in, and our situation is no different. Now, there would be no torque if there were no friction, because if there were no friction, there would be no traction. Um, and if there were no traction, then the wheel wouldn't move the object, and that would make no sense. Okay, so a couple of things we want to talk about. One is, if a wheel is rolling and not slipping, so think slower moving robot. Traction is going to equal to max static friction. That's just a given. If a wheel is rolling and slipping, then traction is going to be closer to kinetic friction. Both of these are going to occur on a regular basis in the course of a robotic interaction. Just remember that this is only going to happen, that second scenario is only going to happen when the uh, force that's being applied so the torque that's being applied is going to be greater than the static friction that was present in the beginning. Okay, 
So let's talk practical things. If we want to increase traction of our wheels with our surface, we have to increase friction somehow. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to do when you're back next week is to come up with ways to increase the grip your wheels have on the surface that we play on. There are, again, there are two ways. One way is to increase grip of the wheels on the ground, and the other is to increase the weight of the bot, which also increases the normal force, which means the bot presses down with a greater force. Okay, so a lot of what we have done this particular year is to build a pushing robot, a robot that can push or pull with large force. In order to do this, it has to have really good traction and it has to have torque that's actually driving those wheels forward. Now, something to remember is that friction is reactive. It is not something that will be there unless there is an applied force and traction in the first place. In order to maximize friction and to use it to your advantage, you need to make sure that you have increased the torque enough to at least overcome static friction on the wheels. And that is something we've all done already, okay? We've done that by making sure that we use certain types of wheels in the front or in the back of our robot. We've done that by making sure that if we are using a motor that we're using it a certain way and that we're using it properly. From there, we talk about terminology and drivetrains because the next thing we have to talk about are the types of drivetrains that you can build. Um, some pieces of information we need to make sure we go over. First is what exactly is a drive wheel? That's just gonna be a wheel that is actually used to propel robots forward. So this is the wheel that's attached to the motor, if you will. Turning point is gonna be um, how, think about like turning surface or turning radius. Um, this is how much space the robot needs to turn. Turning scrub is going to be the friction. Uh, if we in if we think about it, friction caused by the wheels is going to um, be caused by the turn itself. Uh, if we if we think about it from a more friction or force based perspective, turning scrub is going to be the thing that resists the turn itself. From there, we've got a chasis. So this is the bot that holds the wheels, motors, and gear. So this is like the square frame that you've built. Think of it more like the frame of everything that's holding everything else together. And then we have a zero radius turn, which is another term, piece of terminology that talks about how if a robot can turn without moving forward or backward, that means that this particular type of turn would have a zero radius. All right, from there, we talk about the five different types of drivetrain. The first is going to be Ackerman car style steering. In this particular type of drivetrain, all wheels move in the same exact direction. They either move forward or backwards. There is no turning scrub when it is properly set up, but it is not able to perform a zero radius turn. For our particular um, purposes, a zero radius turn would be super useful. The field is not huge and doing that would be very beneficial if we could the zero radius turning mean. Okay, the next type is gonna be the skid steer. This is the most common type. This is what we call tank drive. We've used this in our particular um, examples this semester where we mount all four wheels, but if we turn one wheel um, at a slower pace than the other, it causes the actual turn. This one is going to be able to do a zero radius turn. Um, it also has, um, it also has the ability to do, um, it also has the ability, sorry, um, to make sure that when the turn happens, that it happens relatively quickly. So this is kind of an interesting type of drivetrain. That's why we started with this one. It's also the most basic out there. There are some things that we can talk about as far as like the manipulation of this type of drivetrain. Um, remember that only two of the wheels are typically motorized, so only two of them are controlled by motors. The others are going to be um, free spinning. Um, this type of drivetrain also does have what we call turning scrub. The turning point is also on a point in the middle. All right, so more skid steer uh, types that we're going to talk about. Um, this one specifically in front of you, you see a few different types of skid steers. You see ones that have multiple wheels instead of just four. You see ones that have treads instead of wheels. Um, now really the major benefit to adding more and more wheels is that you can make a bigger and bigger robot and a bigger and bigger frame. For us, we don't necessarily want to make a bigger, bigger and bigger base for our particular purposes, but if you wanted to, um, skid steer is a very good way to do it. 
All right, next is gonna be Swerve Drive. Swerve Drive are going to be where wheels are going to be powered to go moving forward or backward, um, but can also be independently steered. So each one gets its own motor. So if I wanted to turn one on a Swerve, I could. Now, these particular types of wheels as if you can see, I'm not quite sure if you can or not, but these are able to actually swerve within place. So they're attached to um, gears in this particular example. And when the gears turn, so does the wheel. So they can point in any direction, which means they can also have some pretty cool abilities to move in all directions. Now, one of the drawbacks to this is that these are all gonna require their own motors, four motors on those wheels alone. And you only have five total motors to work with in your particular model. All right, crab drive is going to be something that's a little bit more complicated and I don't have a picture for you, but um, this is going to use two sets of the skid steer drivetrain. So we're going to have a forward backward um, manipulation where we have wheels that are pointing forward and backward at the same, I'm sorry, that are that are going to be motored up, right? So we're going to have two wheels that are motored moving forward, backward, and then we're going to have two that are moving horizontally opposite of those, so perpendicular of them, and each one's going to be, um, only one set is going to be on the ground at a given time. So that's why it's called crab, because it can move up and down. So if you're moving forward backward, you would have your forward backward wheels on the ground and your horizontal wheels um, up in the air. If you wanted to move horizontal, you'd have to pick up the forward backward wheels and you'd have to put the horizontal wheels down. Um, it's interesting because it has a zero turning point radius and the you can make it pretty fast. Um, the cool thing is that it's able to kind of move a little differently than what we're used to. Um, and it's going to have very precision based benefits. The last type of drivetrain that we're going to talk about is the omnidirectional drivetrain. And this is one that we tend to be very interested in building ourselves when we talk about types of drivetrains for you to work with next week. Um, this particular type of drivetrain is super beneficial because it can go any different direction that you want at any moment without steering. Um, the omni wheels themselves are these types of wheels. And again, I know you've all seen them before because you were you put two of them on your original robot. These Omni wheels can go in all directions. That's why the term Omni is used. Um, they are allowed to move forward and backward and they have very low friction on them. The big drawback to an omnidirectional drivetrain is you would need a lot of different motors. And this is the reason why. So you would want to power motors in both directions. In both of these designs, um, you're either using three or four motors and you would have to power each wheel with at least one motor. In the left design, you'd have to power each wheel. Um, you'd have to power at least two of the front or two of the back wheels on the right design, as well as power the middle one. Um, there's a couple of different reasons why this might be really beneficial, but for us so far, really the best model and hands down easiest to build is going to be the skid steer model. So skid steer is, of course, like we said, two different uh, motors controlling two different wheels. These are going to be uh, very beneficial as far as zero radius turns. And really, this is the one, aside from maybe the omnidirectional type of drivetrain, that can do zero radius turns. So for the purposes of the competition we've been studying, this is going to be the best one to choose. The two product, the two things that we have to um, consider are going to be torque and turning scrub. Um, and these are two that we have to try to maximize or minimize depending on what we're trying to do. Um, remember that turning torque is just about the uh, turning point and that turning scrub is the friction that is going to resist the turning itself. Um, Sometimes scrub can be very useful. It's not always bad to have friction opposing turns, especially if you want to make those turns precise and you don't want to just kind of be flying all over the place. So just kind of keep in mind, this is all about a balance between the two. Um, in skid steer specifically, um, remember that we can, uh, we can control how quickly the wheels move. We can't necessarily change the direction that they move, but we can control how quickly they move. So if for once, if we want to move this thing in a complete circle, we're going to 
um, apply forces in opposite directions to the wheels that are motored. And by doing so, the thing will just start to spin. Everything um, on the other ends will start to just kind of drag and do exactly what we're supposed to do in terms of helping to um, slow down the spin itself. If we want to, um, if we want to create a more traditional design, then we would point all four wheels in the same direction, um, and we would point we would appoint two of those wheels with uh, motors as well. Okay. All right. So something to remember, some big ones to make sure that we understand all of the wheels that you put on this robot are going to contribute to our turning torque and turning scrub, both of which you need in order to create a decent moving robot. Now, a couple of things we're going to talk about in order to make sure that we are doing things to our own satisfaction is that we want to make sure that we can reduce turning scrub. So we want to reduce that friction to a certain point. Um, we can do this by um, reducing frictional force altogether, so by making the wheels less grippy, if you will. Um, or we can increase the distance that the wheel is from the turning point of the robot itself. If we want to increase the torque, so the force of which this is happening, one of the things we can do is increase friction instead, so increase the grippiness of the wheels, um, or increase the weight of the robot itself. Um, we can also increase the distance from the turning point. I'm sorry, to reduce turning scrub, you want to reduce the distance. You don't want to increase the distance. All right, so um, the best thing that we can do in order to reduce turning scrub is we can put omni wheels on our robot. Okay, these have no sideways, sideways friction because they have, they have rollers that help them turn in that particular direction. So these can go any direction. Um, so there is no turning scrub from those particular types of wheels. So that's one way to decrease sideways friction. Um, a couple of other things that we can describe, and we talked about this, like increasing turning point distance or decreasing turning point distance. If we increase the distance that um, some of our wheels are and we create something that's like maybe longer, um, this thing is going to have pretty poor turning characteristics, um, but it will have pretty high turning scrub, so it'll have some pretty decent friction. Um, it will not have a zero radius turn, something to kind of think about. If we the, instead go the more horizontal way, we would have better turning characteristics, um, but lower friction on these wheels with the um, on the on these wheels with the with the actual ground. So just kind of keep in mind there are some different ways to design your drivetrain. Um, you will be asked next week, like I said, to kind of talk about ways that you can increase friction on your wheels or change up your drivetrain or how you would change up your drivetrain. And there are some really simple answers to those. Um, but I do want you to start thinking about how these things work and how to do that as well. Otherwise, you have a great day.